Right, I'm uh, behind the umbrella because it's windy and the wind in this mic's not great. So I'm down here in deepest Devon at Angler's Paradise. I'm uh, coming down trying to see what fish I can catch because down here um, they've got some really good mixed fishing. Different lakes, loads of different lakes. I can't tell you how many lakes. A lot windier. They gave high pressure coming in. So I thought, do you know what? Fill the car up with fuel. Sell the wife to do that nowadays, obviously. And then um, hack on down here three and a half hours, whatever it is, and give it a go. It's grey, cloudy, but at least it's not raining. I'm down in what they call um, sort of middle lake, so just a small one. There's people over there, and this is an island in the middle here. So I'm just trying to give an illustration of what you can catch. Um, oh yeah, we've got builders working up there in a minute. Well, they've been there for a while, so it's going to be noisy. Um, generally down in Angler's Paradise, it's really quiet. But the guys are working, they're building one of those pagoda things that uh, I think it's a whole new lake being constructed there. Um, get some bread. This is beginners, beginners, right? All you need is a bit of bread and you can come to a little lake like this, which is obviously heavily stocked, but you can refine your techniques for catching on bread, floating crust, you know, sinking flake, pellets on the bottom, float fishing, ledgering. You can practice and learn on light, small carp. And some not so small carp, some five pound up, but you know, um, that's better get the odd big one in here. So I'm going to be rigging my two Avon rods up. I'm going to fish one with a waggler float, but I'm not fishing below the surface. And the other, oh, it comes to rain. Oh, happy days. And I'll give you a tip on free lining as well. So all I'm using, cheapo bread. At the time of writing, it's going up daily. This is like 65p maybe 70p but if you get them out of date on those out of date shelves you can get them for 50 pence or less sometimes sometimes 20 pence it's sliced bread it comes with two what are called decent crusts one at the top one at the bottom the rest is soft in the middle which is good for flake fishing but i find if you peel this off like this keep the crusts then you break this up look for which way the ripple is pushing like it's going down that way and you have to make sure you don't feed it and then the wind takes the floating bread away from the fish and you can't reach them. So don't neglect those margins. You know what I like margin fishing. I'm going to throw some down here. They will come up. I'm almost 100% sure I'm going to catch something, but hopefully I might be able to show you to camera. So I'm going to get these in the water. Let's save those crusts because these are going to break up and use them as hook bait and loose feed. So I'm just splitting out all for kids. Split out the flake, break it all up. Oh, I've seen a fish move already. He's seen me doing this, I think. Break it all up like this. And I'm just gonna heave it all out there. Don't neglect the margin, it's really close as well. Now guys, there's fish, gonna be moving on that in the next minutes, five minutes. Look, they might be small ones, but they're fun to catch and you can get some big ones coming as well. And I'm gonna show you, hopefully, how they're taking them off the top. It's by scattering it in several areas, you're covering it visually with your eye. You just look around, if there's nothing taking it, you don't cast there. I'm only casting for fish that start feeding on this. I'll throw the bread somewhere that you can uh, pick it up with a camera. But they're certainly down close. Let's get the other camera and check it out. So there we go. Watch this.
Now, I don't know if you noticed there, I'll try and get it in slow motion, but even those, those fish came straight on the feed. One, because they fish for, it's a commercial fishery, came up and just nosed it. Now, they're the fish you need to see the mouth close around that bait before you strike. And sometimes, even then on hard fish waters, they just don't shut their mouth tight enough. So when you strike, the hook pops out the bread and you miss it. But if you wait just a millisecond, for the, don't strike at the swirl is what I can say. Don't strike at the swirl. If you do have to do that, sort of try and slow yourself half a second, a second or something like that, just so they shut their mouth and move down. Now let's see if we can get one of these guys hooked up and see what they look like. So just to give you an idea, you can see it's nice and smooth there. Get your piece of bread soft piece of bread in the middle, push it through and then turn it and just tap the hook point through the other side. But important, this is the doughy bit, just pinch it onto the eye of the hook, leaving the point clear. So it doesn't actually sort of put a big hard gobby piece of dough over the point of the hook, that's important. Then of course, you know, you can just dip it in the water if you want to, to give it a bit of extra casting weight. Let me just show it to you there. It's just a random piece of flake. I mean, it's dead easy why people don't use more flake, especially beginners, I don't know. Bread flake, bread crust. You can use sinking bread flake or a piece of crust on the surface, obviously, in a sort of commercial area. So I just go down and look. I just dip it once. That's all I do. Flick it out. And you just might be able to see a fish come up on this. Boom. Fish on. It's as simple as that. Certainly not a two pounder. Tips for beginners. Obviously, under normal circumstances, I probably wouldn't fish right next to that snag. Good fun, eh? Be good fun if this wind dropped. Look at it, it's grey and horrible. I'm only f I'm fishing here because out there is a big shadow line thrown from that island, and that actually gives me a good visual there for a seeing fish and b photographing. Well, I thought they were all two pounders, but this one's not two pounds. No, it's a beauty. Avon rod, just regular, I think this is six pound line, might be eight, <laughs> look at that, and you could do this with a match rod, any type of rod, ledger rod, if you're a beginner you could double up with like a spinning rod and try it. I'll give you a couple other tips in a minute. He's fighting a lot harder than I thought he would. Oh no, pretty mirror can't. It's not going where am I? Still not done. Remind you, I got him. Okay, let's take a look at him. A couple of scales missing, but then, as I say, it's a commercial fishery, so almost I have to say the scales on this one, and he's probably close to five pounds. Sort of almost ornamental type scales on it. Nice fish, nice mouth. There we go. Bit of fun on Ava Royal. Let's get it back. Let's look at number 49 bus. I feel there's another coming along shortly. Now let's say you wanted to cast over or your bread drifts out of distance. You maybe want a bigger hook, depending on the fishery rules, wherever you are. You might go up to even, I don't know, four, size four. 
so it's six, perhaps an average for a big piece of crust. And then you can make what we call a pyramid crust, and that's one I sort of made up myself for casting, and it gets you farther, but generally you want a, a, a bigger hook to support it. Um, I'll show you. So if you get bread, like here, I mean, I'm throwing it over that way, that the wind will drift it. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> Before it even drifts out, it's getting eaten. But there will be situations where it drifts away. It might go underneath that island edge there, and there could be some really big fish there, you know? Um, and that's a good spot. You can't quite get to it, and you don't want to put anything heavy, like a bubble float, controller float, so that sort of thing on. You just want to still keep free lining. Then you do this. That generally works well with what we call a tin loaf. Well, I call them a tin loaf. Somebody please tell us. Look, this is obviously a sliced loaf. It's sliced bread. It's not the greatest, but it does. It's a whole loaf, and I believe it's baked in a tin. When it comes out, it's like this all over. So you've got crust all around the outside, top, bottom. Brilliant. If you were going to big carp, floater fishing properly, I would be using a tin loaf. But for this sort of fishery, just a bit of fun. If you're beginners, just get yourself a slice loaf. The tin loaf that we talk about has a huge amount of bread flake in the middle and it's nice and soft and doughy and it makes excellent bait for uh, float fishing uh, or ledgering you know on the on the bottom or under the water so I just want to do this I want to cut down strips just like this now these are going to be my throw-ins put them down there for now brilliant if there's no ducks So I want to go small here, very small like this, a little bit bigger, and then a bit bigger again. Okay, so you've got three different sizes there. So making the pyramid crust, what I do, I've got now three different size pieces of crust. Going in for the white side first through the, you know, to the brown side, I put the smallest piece of crust on first roll it gently around the hook, pop it over the eye. Take the next or middle sized piece of crust, put it through the middle, through the white side, out the crust, pop it over the hook, eye. Then I reverse it this time. I go in through the crust first, bring the bend out, there's the hook point, just tap it lightly into the crust. Now this is important, slide your others down one will go over the eye and the other will just rest and that makes a sort of pyramid shape will give you extra casting weight see that ridge along there it would be really good if you're on a big carp water when it drifts away now just going to dab it once that's it it's got enough weight and you just lob it you just toss it look, through the air like that you're tossing it through the air just move it once and that slides them all down on top of each other and then you just got to wait. But you can see I've gone, what, three times the distance. It's just drifting in a belly in the wind, going that way. And I'm on. That is the pyramid crust in action. And ironically, this is a small carp. You think it, bigger bait, bigger fish, it doesn't always work like that. One looks like a common. Now you can see a lovely big orange paddle on this little common carp. They're not big fish, you know, I suppose if you had a 10 pounder it would be a big fish in there. But it does give everybody a bit of action and it hones your technique. You can learn more on a water like this. If you do want to use flake like this, you're using the center of the bread. Obviously it's very light, in windy conditions like I've got here, I've got the wind off my back. If you break it up like this, as per previous instructions, you can just gently, and I do mean gently, one gentle squeeze, not hard, look, if you squeeze it hard, watch, that's sinking, that's just a lump of dough, straight down. So just break your pieces up and just lightly squeeze them, just very, very lightly. And that will give you just enough bondage together, together that all those pieces of flake will add up 
and you can get them out a little bit farther. Now the benefit of what happens here is when they hit the water they're hit in a bunch but then they will be spread apart like this but they'll be close together so when one carp comes up he'll get either very greedy or his actions will attract another carp and trust me this applies to double figure to 20 pound fish exactly the same. Let's get in the water I'll show you. Okay in goes the bread some pieces of crust there I'll just zoom in with the camera I'm trying to do all this one-handed bait up and throw in now watch for the carp boom one piece has gone already look 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 he's had a look look he's nervous boom 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 here he goes wait for that last piece to go and of course that could be the piece of your hook in it boom this works particularly well for when you're fly fishing if you want to go fly fishing on the surface of carp you still have to sort of chum them up bring them up to the surface but if you keep that cluster together like that you can drop your fly in much easier and you've got a much better chance of a take Whereas if they're spread out all over the place, you throw them in loose and they're splattering everywhere, you're continually up and down casting trying to find that fish. It's ideal if you can keep them close together. I feel once they've taken one, they actually get more confident. Let's see if I catch another one. Well, I've now had a good bit of action, had about five, six fish. Obviously I could just keep going and going and going like this. The idea is just to show you guys how to fish bread really, successfully, if you're a beginner, you can have some fun. Uh, how close will they come? I'm going to catch one. So close. Unbelievable. They come right into the rushes, right by your feet. And I'm talking not just here. If you sit quietly, even for bigger carp, they will come in close. See if we can get one hooked up. Right, there's a piece of bread over there. There's the overflow there. And there's some stems just there. I'm going right by the stems. Might take him a minute to find it. I wet the bait once. Always check your drag fishing at close range. So crash, fish straight on there. Now you've seen how close they come in. I can't get much closer than that. I'm standing back up the bank as it is trying to keep the rod. Look, I'm virtually more than half of a rod section over the bank as it were. Might run a rescue going around that little outlet grill there. I think they call those a monk for overflows of water. But I'm using the Avon rod, so it's quite soft, cushions for the fish. In it comes, into the net, comes another one. Sometimes when you can't actually see the fish close their mouth around the bait, if you fish a waggler float about here, about a foot from the actual piece of floating crust, let them take the bait. Now you might not see the mouth shut, but you wait for the float just above under before you strike. So I'll see if I can get it on the other camera. I won't get it on this one. I'll try and get it on the other camera for you. It's just another way of picking up the extra fish, usually at distance. So I've got a standard waggler float there. Shop uh, locked um, top and bottom. And you can see from the shot here to where I put the bread, maybe a foot. So there's two other different ways you can fish like this. Same principle. You just put a piece of crust on the hook. So you're fishing exactly the same, but because you're going to be missing fish at range by not being able to see the mouth actually shut around them, this way you'll see that float twitch. You do not strike until you see the float twitch. See if we can pick one up. I miss a carp, but look what I got. I think that one there. I can hold it still. It's just free lining, it's called. But instead of watching a float or a ledger or a buzzer or a bobbin, you're feeling across the top of your fingers a tug on the line, or you watch where it enters the water. The best one is where it enters you, you know, the water from your rod top. So you cast the flake in as it's sinking slow like this. If you see it tweak, you can strike. Let's see if we can get one on a piece of flake, free lining, and of course, if you pinch it, it sinks. If you want to get it down faster, just put a small shot on there, a BB, something like that, or 
anything larger if it's very windy. So you can go overhead cast or you can go an underhand cast, wherever you want. As soon as the line hits the surface, I do like a turn or two just to make sure there's no loose line between, you know, the bait, the sinking and uh, the rod top because I want to be feeling every little twitch or tug of the line. Look, I'm straight on there. Fish has come up, sucked it in and I've nailed it. Well, there's no shortage of fish in here. Really pinged off, it's just a small common. So there's another mirror carp. So I've had what five now. Guys, you're on. Hopefully you got that one. There's always something about seeing a float go under. And he came off, we'll get another one. What I'll do is I'll delay the strike so you can see the float go under. Here's another mirror there. And finally another tip is free lining. That's with the first rig I had, just a hook and touch ledger and across your fingers. So there's the float guys. That's how close it was fishing to the bait. So you can use it, but not too far away, not a long one I find. So about 18 inches and this one, if it holds still, is a very pretty fish indeed. Now finally, some of those pieces of bread flake will sink. Now if you put a piece of bread flake on and even throw that in amongst a floating crust, you can still pick a fish up. And I'm gonna try and do that on the float. Well, hopefully you got a few tips uh, there on the bread flake fishing and crust fishing. I've uh, obviously caught enough carp over there. I've come to another one called a tench lake, because here at Anglers Paradise, they do actually have so many lakes all over the place and uh, a lot of different species in them. It's taken me a bit of a while to find it. This one's called the tench lake. It's actually dug out in the shape of a tench. And um, I remember years and years ago catching a grass carp in it, so I've thrown some bread out there. 
and it's just going to see if anything does come up it looks over in the corner there so there's two slices of bread anyway that uh, have not been taken some fish topping way over there probably rudder i guess we're just going to have five minutes standing here yeah small run um just in case anything comes up around this island and the wind's going to push the bread out hopefully i see a little golden rod there around the bread and very often it takes a bit of activity from the small fish to get the bigger fish to come around the sun has come out so there's plenty of lakes down at angler's paradise for you to move around on you do get wind up there don't get me wrong you can have sheltered spots but you know they can get wind coming off the mountains there up on the uh up on the center of the um, land mass you can see them way in the distance there got nice pagodas pretty well laid out and um, a good mixture of fish in there there's no question you can do float fishing you can ledger all the different techniques if anything they're small enough these lakes i think really they're good for float fishing now what's that up there i believe that's bobmin way in the distance you can see it's way higher than anywhere else because there's no trees growing on it so a good section there of what we call prime float fishing water. I've already thrown some crust in, hoping I would get something, maybe at grass cart, which I called there before, or you can go by the side of the lilies for some of the tents. They've got golden tents there as well. Well, listen, there's some tips here there that I feel sure the different ways of fishing that bread and bread crust might pick up some extra fish, especially for beginners. Yes, a loaf of bread, man. That's all it takes a lot of time. Check your fishery rules. Some places ban it. Obviously, I suppose, because it's too good, isn't it? It's a loaf of bread. Give it a go. It's worth a try. Now, I've got to finish off with talking about the rivers. Yeah, the rivers in the UK. They're not in a good state, are they? They're just getting bashed with everything. Cormorants, otters, red signal, crayfish, reduced flow. Now we're learning on it. Well, we're not learning of it. We all knew that a lot of anglers for years. Sewage being pumped in there willy-nilly. I mean, they're just under such pressure. I went down my local stream, had a look at it. I thought, it's worth me putting this up because it's just a mention. You can see it is lovely clear water, but I'm telling you, it's, not what I, you know, it's just not what it was when I was a nipper. Now, my concern is this is... A stream or river, small river you can call it, it, used to be fast flowing. It's not far from where I live. It's got a lot of, I'm going to call it sludge. I don't know what else you can call it. It's silt, there's been a suspension. However, if you stare hard, there's a little baby tiny weeny wild trout there. You'll see them turn away in a minute. Very small fish. That would be a wild one, wild brown trout. But you'll notice where he was. He was over the clear at gravel. He wasn't over the sludgy, silty bit. And of course you get a lot of weed in the shape of duckweed. Now we never used to see that so much years ago. And to me the duckweed is associated with slower flows. And look here, the marginal bank, there's a ball walk, but you can see originally that river would have been a lot wider. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. All this encroachment of vegetation is going in there because there is less flow. There is more water, I believe, being taken out for abstraction for all the various housing estates or whatever. And that's why you see not stream of weed. I can't tell you the name of the weed. No, I don't know the name of that weed. Somebody else might tell me what it is. Waters, Crowfoot or whatever. But look at the, the silt of suspension that's, that's, that's dropped on there. I don't think, to be honest, there would be any form of sewage over spilling there. I don't know. They've tried to repair the banks here and increase the flow by putting this sort of artificial fencing, if you like, under the water. Now look in the top of the picture, you'll see this gravel where the acceleration of the flow has indeed given you a little bit better weed and that clear gravel, can you see that? There's a little baby trout there just laying there about six inches long, like barely that. And that's the gravel flow increased, uh, the gravel patch increase with the flow of the river.
Here, where it comes out below the mill, you can see the bubbles going through, whizzing through much faster. Now, just take a note, you can see the dark areas on the left and in the distance. There's a good 30 foot of clear gravel. And that's what it used to be like when I was a kid in the whole river. I'm just telling people this because the new generation, the youngsters coming along now, will think it used to look like this sort of brown sludgy all the time. No, it didn't. There's the old mill house. And they've got here where it goes through the mill on the right, an overspill here. You just see it like a sluice. They look at a board that can be raised or level, uh, raised a level, or you know to push water down through the mill. But there it is again. Look, the silt or sludge. It was much deeper than this when I was a kid. So there you go. It's just an observation. It won't catch me any more fish though. I used to enjoy my river fishing. Indeed, I do, but. Finding good fishing now is harder and harder and harder and it's no wonder that there are less and less anglers on the river and less young anglers going on there because A it's harder to find the fish and B where are the fish? If you've got good river fishing good luck to you. I envy you. I'm still searching. I stumble across a bit every once in a while but boy it's getting harder. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. We'll see you on the next one, see what else I can rustle up, and hopefully a few big fish.